chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. And it's the two roads and taking the one less traveled. Two roads, one less traveled. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, uh, King James Version says, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Well, the Message Bible has, don't look for shortcuts to God. The market is flooded with surefire, easygoing formulas for a successful life that can be practiced in your spare time. Don't fall for that stuff, even though crowds of people do. The way to life, to God, is vigorous and requires total attention. Now, it would seem the, the obvious declaration that Jesus is preaching here is the two roads. Uh, there is a bad way, wrong way of sin, and there is a good way of holiness and closeness to God. There are but two ways. There are right and wrong, right with Jesus, wrong without Jesus. And, you know, it isn't that we would have this ability to always be right. I remember that little cartoon, the pastor was counseling this guy, and the cartoon stated, it isn't a spiritual gift to always be right. <laughs> okay, so anyhow, there's good and evil. There is the way to heaven, the way to hell. Every person is walking one of these two roads. So everyone is on one of these two roads. And the scripture says that the broad way is a way of selfishness, where there is no hedges, where there are no boundaries. The way that appears to be right in the eyes of an individual, where there is no higher power, there is no greater influence than themselves. And this the scripture refers to as there is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction. A road where accountability is determined by self, where the accountability is made up of your own particular rules, where people become gods and they think uh, that things become status symbols, a road where heartache has no purpose, where life has no greater need than the serving of itself, and where death is a mystery, and that there's nothing beyond a grave. And as we continue to see what this road, what this road may look like, it is a road where laws are made to be broken, where selfish desires become the dreams of our destiny, where progress is determined by stepping on or over people trying to achieve that great status that is ever elusive. The broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. The Message Bible says, don't look for shortcuts to God. So, Whenever we think of being two roads, when we think of that there is a path of righteousness, there's a, ta there's a path of unrighteousness. And sometimes it's hard to know. Uh, and there, there are it's black and white, but yet there are no, there's seemingly gray areas. Well, can I do this and can I do that? Well, which road are we on and how do we want to live on this road? And I think that in the scripture that Jesus is telling us here, and that there are two roads, but there is characteristics that we are to follow on these roads. The road of straight is the narrow, straight is the path, narrow is the gate. And there, is, there are characteristics that are to dominate this road. But this being able to choose, being able to choose which road and understand the, the characteristics of the road. Anybody ever hear of um, Robert Frost? Yeah, he's the guy who makes cakes, frosty cakes. <laughs> Robert Frost is a po has a poet, and anybody know the name of his, one of his famous poems? The Road Not Taken. Anybody ever read that one? The Road Not Taken. I'll read it if you haven't. Two roads diverge in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood, and looked down down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as far that the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step and trodden black, Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, 
I doubt if I should ever come back. I shall, tell, I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverge in a wood, and I took, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. So, the road, two roads less, one road less traveled, taking the road less traveled. The road not taken in this um, poem, critics have tried to analyze the poem, and to what end the poem takes is truly, you know, up to the reader. We sometimes try to get into the mind of the poet to know what Frost's intention was and what he was trying to say. Well, probably he was trying to say, it's up to you to determine the way. And how that we look at it and find that uh, there are two roads, there are always two roads to choose from, there's always a, a choice that we make, and we wonder what are the choices and where will the road take us? You know, and whenever we think of this, and, and um, when I think of this, I think of people. <laughs> I think of people that perhaps, perhaps, well, some sat here years ago, many years ago, uh, and at that point in their life, they were, I'm, I, there's one individual I remember, but it, I'm not going to tell you who it is and stuff like that. But I remember one individual that sat here, and he and his wife and children were here in church. And it was a crossroads in that individual's life. And I don't think they, that he knew what it was. Because he talked to me about coming to church, and he came a couple of times. He said, you know, I just don't think this religion thing is right for, for me and my family. I, I don't think that, this, that it's so narrow, because I, I'm kind of exploring the these, these spiritual stuff. And, you know, it's like it was including all everything. Well, anyhow, this individual never came back to church. And in this case, this person went down the wrong road which led to <clears throat> the you know, just total disaster for his life and for the, the life of his family. And I always felt bad because, you know, whenever you think of that, uh, you think of how, what if you had said something differently? What if you had been able to present the message in a different way? What if you had been able to say things differently? Would have that made a difference in his life? And <clears throat> I, don't, I, I don't know. I can you know, just don't know, but the final decision is always up to the person. And we will stand before God, and that person can't say, well, you know, that preacher didn't say it right, or I would have believed. <laughs> well, we can't, we have to look at our life and realize that we are at a crossroads. We make decisions all the time. And we've got to make decisions based upon the truth of God's word. And how that, it isn't, God doesn't look to separate us from him. He looks to bring us close to him. And that every trial and every difficulty may not originate with God. And that things of the past may have been totally blown out of the water and blown away. But that, that's not the important thing. The important thing is that we recognize that we're, we're traveling with God. And that God is with us and that we make decisions based upon our understanding of God and his love for us, and staying on a path that will take us to where we need to be. Because there are lots of paths, there are lots of trails that will lead to destruction, and they look very appealing. They look as if this is the place and this is the direction I want to go, because it fits in with my group that I am associated with. Or it fits in with, you know, an easier task. Well, I'm not good enough for being a Christian. You see, those are the roads and the temptations that lead to destruction. And God doesn't lead us on that path. God leads us on a path that will take us someplace. That place is heaven. And our past is not what dictates whether we go to heaven or not. Our present and our relationship with Jesus Christ is what determines where we will spend eternity. So here we are in our life making a decision based upon our belief and what Jesus Christ has promised us 2,000 years ago 
that he died on the cross to forgive us of our sins and that his blood would wash away all our sins, he rose from the dead, that the same spirit that rose Jesus, that raised Christ from the dead dwell in us will quicken our mortal bodies. You know, I may I'll preach on this sometime too, was when Lazarus was sick, okay? Lazarus was sick, Mary, Martha. I've spoken on this a number of times, but there's one little point I... I, I came across and makes a different impact for me. Mary and Martha know that Jesus loves Lazarus and loves the two of them. He is, he's their best friend. They are his best friends outside of the disciples. And so Jesus goes to their home and he spends time with them. He works with them. He, you know, anytime he's in the area, he stops in. They have him over for meals. <laughs> you know, he just stop in anytime. Well, when they send word to Jesus, the one you love is sick, Jesus doesn't come. And the questions always are there, well, why doesn't he come, whatever. Well, he has been dead. When finally, Jesus finally arrives, he's been dead for four, year, uh, four days. And um, as we look at that, when Jesus calls Lazarus from the grave, he resuscitates him. He doesn't resurrect him. He resuscitates him. Now, what that means is, you know, we put us on the paddle, put on a ventilator, you know, and you bring it, resuscitates, bring him back to life. He resuscitated him. He didn't resurrect him. Because Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, and Jesus hadn't risen from the dead yet. And so the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead instills in believers the resurrection power. So we can be resuscitated, and, and Lazarus was resuscitated to die again at some later date, but he knew where he was going, and he knew wherever he was going because he was going with Jesus Christ, and Christ is with him. And in our life, there is this understanding about God's love and God's life in us that no matter what happens, we are safe in the arms of our Father, and that we will go to eternity, and heaven is our home, and we have a place there. Not because we've earned it, but because Christ has forgiven us. We have accepted it. Well, the road not taken. Critics have tried to analyze this poem over and over again. One person, Eleanor Sickles, S-I-C-K-E-L-S, says, The human tendency to wobble illogically in decisions and later to assume that the decision was, after all, logical and enormously important, but forever to tell of it with a sigh. Now, in this, in this poem of Frost, it says, I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere in ages and ages hence. I will be reflecting back on this decision with a sigh. And the, this person interprets the sigh as something that the, the speaker, who knows what interesting experience they didn't encounter by taking the, the, the road they did. Because there were experiences on the other road. So at the end of life, Frost is saying, perhaps saying, I will tell the story of my life with a sigh. Knowing that the other road, there were experiences on there that I could have experienced had I gone that road. Well, whenever we are talking about this road that Jesus is telling us of, of the narrow gate and the straightest the gate and straightest the way and narrow is the gate, we will never, ever repeat in eternity that we look back on our life with a sigh. <sighs> Everybody take a deep breath. You know what a sigh is? It's like, I should have said something else. I should have gone somewhere else. The if onlys. But you know, this road that we take with Christ, we will never have a sigh. <laughs> I should have, would have, could have taken and did this. You know, um, the speaker says um, on... Tuesday night, and I've heard this expression before, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, he's, you know, what's he talking about? Well, you weren't part of the, you know, the drug culture, the, you know, the free love, the whatever the 60s represent. Well, I was there, and I remember. Why? Because I was in church. I was in Christ. In college, that was all the, they, the first year Rhonda was there, I was a year ahead of her. Uh, it's the only time I've ever been ahead of her in my life. But anyhow, <laughs> so uh, anyhow, um, you know, the first year, we, well, I think it was her first year, that uh, they, you know, the drugs really started coming into, into university and stuff, and they kicked everybody out that was, you know, kicked out about 15 students who were using drugs, and by the senior year, uh, you know, of, of that college, uh, if they kicked out everybody who'd been on drugs, they'd have kicked out three quarters of the school. And, you know, because it was just one of those things going on at that time. But it was interesting that the ones who became, be, got hooked up on drugs and hooked up on alcohol and the partying and going and being the partying scene and all that, they didn't finish. They didn't finish in their appropriate time, and if they did finish, it was just barely getting by and being able to, to get through. It destroyed, their, it destroyed their life. And you see, we have a place of beginning. And so as I look back over the 60s and the 70s, I don't do that with a, with a sigh because I was doing what I felt was right in serving God. And I did, and, I, and in my dorm room, I had three other guys, and I would, you know, my best friend uh, at the time, he... Uh, <laughs> You know, I'd have to put him to bed. He came in so drunk, you know. And I'd just push him up on the top bunk and he would be drunk and, you know. And we'd talk about God. The other day I, I called him. Uh, well, it was been, been a couple of years ago I called him. And uh, I was, the other day I was talking about this and I remembered. I said, hello, is Bob there? You know, I called up his office. And, and you, mean, you mean doctor so-and-so. I said, oh yeah, Bob. <laughs> and then... Uh, he said, they said, well, who shall I say is calling? I said, well, tell them the most holy reverend bishop of Wimber is calling. <laughs> and the secretary says, oh, Father, I'll tell him right away. <laughs> but there are, there are so many things that go on in our life. And, you know, we've made, and who hasn't made wrong choices? I mean, we've all made them. But you see... The, the life, the choice that we make in serving God will never, ever be looked at with a sigh. The decisions we make in serving God and doing the right thing for the right reasons will never have a sigh. As if I have missed something. As if there were a better way. There is no better way than the way of Christ. There is no better way than the way of forgiveness. There is no better way than the way of love and compassion and forgiveness. There isn't a better way. And yes, we, we fall, we end up you know, stumbling and whatever, but that's not the point. The point is there is no better way. We never give up on our relationship with Christ because Christ never gives up on us. Jesus never has given up on us. No matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, Saul of Tarsus, the killer of Christians, God didn't give up on him, met him on the road to Damascus and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you, why are you hurting me? By hurting my people. So that same Jesus is the same Jesus that we have our relationship with. And, and whenever we make the decisions of our life, it is based upon this relational experience that we have with God and the decisions that we have for walking with God are based upon his word and what it means to us. And Matthew chapter 7 tells of this road. And I just want to read, read some of the scriptures. The King James says in verse 7, well, maybe I'll start with verse 1. <laughs> the road less trouble. Don't pick on people. All right? This is, this is a, in the Message Bible. Don't pick on people. Jump, don't jump on their failures. Criticize their faults. Unless, of course, you want the same treatment. The road that we have with Jesus 
You see, it says, broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrow is the gate, and straight is the path. It means that there are boundaries, and there are, there are traveling, traveling instructions for this road. Don't pick on people, okay? Don't jump on their failures, okay? Don't criticize other people's faults, okay? That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. Oh, that's why he doesn't want us to be critical. He doesn't want it coming back to bop you in the head. You ever thrown a boomerang? I never did. I couldn't get it, I could never get it to come back. <laughs> it's easy to see the smudge on your neighbor's face and, and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. <laughs> Do you have the, the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you when your own face is distorted by contempt? It's this whole traveling road mentality all over again playing the holier-than-thou part instead of just living your part. Oh, so you see, being a Christian and following the road isn't playing a part. It is living the part. We aren't playing the part of a Christian. I'm going to dress up like a Christian today, and I'm going to wear this and act like this to become a Christian. And people, people look foolish that way. You don't play the part. You live the part. I am a Christian because Christ is in my heart and he affects the way that I talk and walk and teach and preach and interact and inter with people. You know, Mother Teresa uh, in Calcutta, uh, one of the missionaries, I think, I know I told the story before, but I'll tell it again. The, the, he's walking, one of our ministers is walking with her uh, down a road, down a street in Calcutta. And while they're together, she stops and goes to a doorway and is holding this man in the doorway. And she's saying, oh, I found him. Oh, I found him. And, you know, the preacher thought, oh, he, she found somebody that she knew. And she was holding him, and he, he died. And the, piece, the minister says, oh, did you know him? She said, no. That was Jesus, and I just found him there. <laughs> As you have done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. You see, we're not acting a part, we are living the part of a Christian. And that whenever we live the part of a Christian, we are expecting the power of God to flow through us, because we can't be this on our own. You can't be a Christian without Christ. And you can't, you can't live in the power of God without the power of God flowing through you. So it isn't about how much we can do for the kingdom. It's how much we are, how, who we are as a person, and how we as a person are touched by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God gives us power and strength in the moment. The moment of temptation, the moment of trial, the moment of decisions, the moment that we need, that God is there to help us. Don't be flipped with the, with the sacred. Don't be flippant with the sacred. Ra banter and silliness give honor. Do not, I can't read my, this writing here. Don't be flipped with the sacred. Banter or silliness give no honor to God. Don't reduce holy mysteries to slogans. And then it goes on, ask, this is the, we're going to go into the uh, chapter, set, verse 7, don't bargain with God, be direct, ask for what you need. Huh. On this road, this path, we aren't finger, finger, God isn't pointing a finger at us, so why should we be pointing fingers at others? Hmm. And what you need on this road, don't bargain with God. You know, God, you do this, I'll do that. Don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. This isn't a cat and mouse hide-and-seek game we're in. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. That's the King James. If your child asks for bread, do you trick him with sawdust? If he asks for a fish, do you scare him with a live snake on his plate? As bad as you are, you wouldn't think of such a thing. You're at least decent to your own children. So don't you think the God who conceived you in love will be better? 
will be even better? You see, the road that we are walking on isn't guilt and condemnation. It's aliveness and, and, and an understanding of faith and understanding of relational experiences and understanding of being supportive and, and loving and caring. Here's a simple rule of thumb. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Grab the initiative and do to others. You see, that's what we're talking about whenever we look at this road. It isn't looked back on with a sigh. wonder what would happen if I had taken the other road. Well, the scriptures tell us if we reject Christ, we're lost for an eternity. But not only that, in this life, we're alone. We're without hope. And nothing but my highest goals are all that I can achieve. It's so limiting. You know, that's, it's, it's, it's really something how that critics will tell Christians that they are limiting their life. They're limiting what they can be whenever you become a Christian because you can't do this and can't do that. But it's just the opposite. As a Christian, we have the universe as our playground because the God who created it is a God who lives in us. And this is his universe. This is his place. We are his children. And the creativity that is in our minds is the creativity that he has given us. And that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, there is a power and an expectation that is alive in us that is greater than anyone could ever imagine because we cannot even imagine the things that God has prepared for us. And so in our hearts and in our minds, there's a way that God is at work in us. And whenever we travel this road, there is no sigh. If I had taken the other road, I would be lost. But I'm not lost. I still have to make decisions. I still have to pray and ask for God's guidance. But you know, no matter what road, God has a way of working all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God has a way of taking my road. And you know, I may have gotten off a little bit, but you know what? God has a way of bringing me back. God has a way of keeping me on the path. I may fall down. I may need to camp here for a while, but that's okay because I will not reach eternity and look back with a sigh. I will look back and say, God, you have taken, guided my footsteps every step of the way. <laughs> That's assurance. See, Jesus is talking about the road. He's talking about the choices and how we live on this road. How we live on this road. It's not a condemnation or a guilt trip. It's not a narrow life. It's a full life. Narrow? It's only narrow, straight as a gate. Narrow as a gate and straight as a path. Narrow as a gate, meaning Jesus Christ. No one gets to the heaven but through Christ. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. Jesus set that up. He is the gate. That's the only way. He isn't one of many ways. He is the only way. Narrow is the gate. But straight is the path. That this path that I am on is taking me to my destination, my heavenly home. And on this journey with, to my heavenly home, I am walking with Christ each step of the way. And I know that I'm not to jump on other people's problems and kick other people when they're down. I'm to help people whenever they are in need. I am to love people when they are there. And as Mother Teresa found that one in need, she said, I found him. I found him. I found Jesus. <laughs> she found one that she could help, just as Jesus would. You know, and I'll close with this. In Sunday school, I talked about Peter. 
and how that shortly after Pentecost, Peter comes across this individual who is lame, can't walk, you know, crippled. And Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give, it, give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. What Peter was doing was it dawned on him at that moment that he was a continuation of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. That's when it all came together. That's one of the first miracles. And he said, in the name of Jesus, he recognized that what Jesus was doing, he is now a continuation of. And that the power of Christ now flows through him to touch the life of this needy man. That's us. The continuation of Christ flowing through us to touch the needs of the lives of others. We have a purpose on this road less traveled. Shall we stand? Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have heard our prayers. We thank you, Lord, that you know our needs. And God, there is no sigh of what could have been, only what is, and the power to make the right choices where we are at in our life. I pray, Lord, you encourage our hearts, you give us the strength for this day. Flow through us, O Lord, let your power, your spirit, just flow through us and encourage us, O Lord, as we realize the value that you have upon our life. Thank you, Jesus for hearing our prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for moving in my life and touching me right here where I'm at. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.